Hey everyone, again, Michael Zuber here, one rental at a time, and we have the great, the one and only, Anna Kelly. How are you doing, Anna? I'm great today, Michael. How about you? I'm doing wonderful. So we just completed our first interview or phase of today's discussion, and that was kind of, hey, the vaccine's out. Did anything change in your business? Hope, what, what's going on? We talked about the CDC Act, uh, eviction moratorium, forbearance, all that good stuff. Uh, generally, it was meant to be a positive video, so thank you for that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to switch it. And, you know, I'm starting to see videos about, you know, winter is here, uh, dark days ahead, COVID hell. You know, we've got six, let's call it six months of rough sledding. So I thought what we would do is we would just talk to people, A, what are we doing in our business, to protect ourselves. And then more importantly, give recommendations out to others who, you know, might be looking at the next six months and, and unsure what to do. Does that make sense? Sure, 100%. Excellent. So what, what are you doing in your business today? Because I think we're both generally agree the next six months are going to be rougher than either of us would like. Yes. Primarily, I'm, I'm getting much more comfortable with the idea of sitting on more cash mm -hmm. and just being conservative and not feeling like I have to have every dollar working every minute. Yeah. So if you had talked to me over the last several years, it'd be like, okay, I'm always playing this dance of, I've got a chunk. I need a big down payment. I'm going to get really lean. And if I have an emergency, well, I've got a lot of credit cards, lines of credit, 401k, but I'm using every penny that's liquid to invest and then, you know, replenish the reserves. Now, because of going through this pandemic and because of having tenants that weren't able to pay for a while and slow pays, you know, yeah. I'm going I don't need to buy everything that I see that might be an opportunity if it's going to put me you know, well under. So I'm really trying to sit with several months operating reserves and mortgage payments for every single building that I own, mm. which before Michael lenders would want to see that. And I'd be like, you must be crazy. Who was what are you doing that? Six months of, you know, mortgage payments when we could be putting that money to work. And yeah. I was always doing that. But I think when there's a time of recession and especially a pandemic, like we, we have not seen before in our lifetimes, um, I think we have to be more cautious. And this to me is a time to look for opportunity, take advantage of opportunities when I see them, but I'm much more focused on asset preservation right now than I am. Let's go out and use every penny I have to create a little more cash flow when that cash flow could be somewhat unpredictable over the next several months, given the pandemic. I am so happy to hear you say that as your step one, because I've been sitting in the same boat right? More cash than I've had at any time in my investing career. Like you, it was always like, all right, it's here. How do I get rid of it? It was like, I need to repel this. Mm -hmm. um, that was just a mindset we had for a while. And yeah, at, right at the end of 2019, I kind of went that direction because things were starting to feel a little bubbly in my market, yeah. right? And again, we need yeah. to learn our market, need to watch it. And, and that's what people don't get, right? There is no one real estate market right? It's, it is, it, it's very local. And then it's even local in asset size, right? So um, I was being very conservative, especially in my market where cap rates on multifamily C-class properties got as low as I'd ever seen. I'm like, my yeah. goodness. And we were talking about, and thankfully, because we do watch the signs before we even knew anything about a pandemic, we were refinancing loans. We were starting to sell some things. We Absolutely. thought they were, there are signs that we might be headed toward a recession. And then the pandemic just kind of accelerated that. So you've always got to watch what's happening with the economy nationally, in your state, locally, what's happening to prices, um, you know. Yeah, I am ahead. so happy I dumped two of my rougher C-class buildings um, right, right at the end of 2019. I'm, I'm still thanking my stars because I know, I don't, I, I guess I could, I guess I could find out, but I don't want to find out. I'm guessing half that building is revolting. Uh, paying rent. Um, so I'm so glad we did that. So again, so we're raising cash. We're uh, much more comfortable. It was weird. So what is it? November? I was still uncomfortable in May and June. It's like, man, why am I looking at my bank statement with, you know, that kind of money and I need to, you know, do something different, but I'm a little bit more comfortable now. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thankfully, you know, because I primarily focus on class B and A areas and mm -hmm. slightly older buildings, most of my tenants are above average income owners. So even through the pandemic, on average, they have $4,000 statistically, $4,000 saved, mm -hmm. a little bit of money in their 401ks. 
And the vast majority, over 98% were faithful to pay, didn't lose jobs. They were either in manufacturing that was deemed essential or they were in some type of job where they could work from home. So I don't think I'm gonna be hit super hard because of the asset class that I focus on, but I still know that there's a lot of uncertainty. And that's what I, I don't do well with. A lot of people don't. So yeah. for me, if there's a lot of uncertainty, if I can mitigate most of the risk, if I can go, here's the, all the warning signs I see, here's the things that can go wrong, but I know how to mitigate that. And if I can mitigate 80% of it and predict 80% of it, I'll take risk for 20%. But when there's so much uncertainty, change in presidency, additional pandemic, maybe shutdowns, maybe additional layoffs in the future, I have to be realistic and say, there's more things that are uncertain than there are certain. And therefore, if I don't have the ability to go, I can invest these dollars with 80% certainty. And if this thing happens, I know how to mitigate it. It's probably better for me to sit on it a little bit and have cash to weather a storm in case anything did get really bad again. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I think is interesting in this crisis is, uh, and again, I don't think we would have said this at, at the end of 19 or the beginning of 20 is, um, I believe I believe migration paths have changed meaning people are exiting kind of um, urban high taxed areas. I don't think that changes. It might slow down, but I don't think that changes. And I also am firmly in the camp of millennials who now many of them are in their thirties are going to become owners versus renters. And, you know, both of those things I think were accelerated by this crisis, but as investors, you and I need to look at that going, you know, how does that impact us? Right. Cause some of those tenants are, the creme de la creme of renters and maybe they become owners in 60 days or, you know, 120 days. What is, what do you think on all of that? Sure. So, you know, if you own in, in highly dense, very, very populated cities, you're probably in for more pain, you know, and, and then you really should have more, you know, more cash reserves. If you own in kind of suburbia, um, you have a lot more demand coming your way than you might have before. And if sure. there's limited supply, you're gonna do really well. So when I'm looking at new properties to buy, for the most part, not 100%, but for the most part, I'm looking in more suburbs of big cities rather than in the downtown areas. I made an exception in Houston for an area that I know extremely well because the area is so um, conducive and popular and probably always will be. Um, for all of the nightlife and restaurants and business meetings and, you know, fun stuff to do, museums, that I think people will continue to go there. Um, and it's a very single demographic, single high income earners, most of which don't want to buy a house. Yeah. I think your couples, your millennial couples that lived, you know, maybe downtown or in apartments, they're trying to, okay, let's buy a house. But if they're single, no desire to get married or have kids, they want to be able to travel, move around for jobs. Um, you're still going to have that that demand and that demographic. The question is how much of the single millennial type of group is going to start buying houses. And again, it all comes back to supply and demand. If you're in an area where there's more demand than supply, you'll still do well even if some of them leave. But if there's a lot of supply and demand is you know continuing to trickle out, then you're in trouble. You might want to think about selling um, in the future. Yeah. So when we go back to the new investors that are maybe in their first recession, right? So A, we talked about, again, our experience getting comfortable with cash. Because I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a real thing. I think people read bigger pockets or they watch YouTube University and they're like, deploy cash, deploy cash. So I think we have both have said, hey, it's okay. You know, in an uncertain environment, having cash is okay. So that was step one. What are some other pieces of advice you might give somebody that maybe doesn't even own a rental yet? Uh, but is interested in moving forward, uh, either as a limited partner in a, perhaps a syndication or on their own with a, a residential property? What's, what's other advice we might give them? Get to know your market really, really well, your market trends and how um, migration is impacting your local market. Um, know the supply and the demand very, very well in your market. Um, you want to probably start investing in properties if, if they're properties for rent where they're first time home buyer price range or less. Yes. So that your rent is quite a bit less than what it would be for someone to buy a house in that same neighborhood. Because mm -hmm. if they can buy a house and you know have a $1,300 taxes and 
you know, insurance and um, mortgage payments all together, and your rent would have been 1400 those people are not going to stay. They're going to go try to buy a house if they can afford it. So start with rentals in a first time home buyer or lower range. Try to make sure you're at least at the 1% rule where you're not paying more than a hundred times the monthly rent on that property. Yep. Um, so that, you know, you have enough cash um, that at least if somebody's out for, you know, more than a month, you can kind of break even. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Again, being comfortable sitting on cash is a good thing. Learning your market is like the number one thing I say. It's, you know, it should be a tattoo on my arm at this point yeah. um, because it really does come down to your local market. There, there's all these people talking about this or that market wide stuff, and there is no real estate market, right? They, we just throw everything in a big bucket, divide by a numerator or a denominator, and boom, there's, that's the average. That average means nothing to you and I. Right. It should mean nothing to them. So. Right. I think that's imperative. Renting below the median, buying below the median for rent below the median is perfect. Uh, again, the, the hardest thing on a landlord, in my experience, is not a vacancy. It's a unit turn, right? That's, that's, what, that's what gets us. So putting yourself in a situation where you may have high turnover, like buying above the median, where somebody's going to like come sit with you for six months as they find the area, that's a recipe to lose a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, you know, the one thing about um, turns too is people that, not always, but people that tend to pay a slightly higher rent or a house tend to take a little better care of it sure. um, than people on a lower socioeconomic um, income rung. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's because, and I can speak for advanced, you know, from experience, so this isn't, isn't trying to be, you know, critical, but you know, when my mom worked two jobs and there's six kids at home, are we caring about how that house looks? Are we drawing on the walls and dropping, you know, big red soda on the carpet and staining it? And yeah, yeah. we are, you know? Yeah. So if, if you're, if you have lower income families that are doing what they need to survive, the reality is if there's kids, they're not going to take as well, uh, you know, as good of a care of that property as somebody that would be, you know, older renting a single family house. So I would try to, you know, rent in areas that have good school districts where your tenants need to make a slightly above average income. Mm -hmm. um, and typically those people are going to be able to take better care of your property and more faithful to be able to pay rent. Yeah. And then the other thing, when you think about kind of, um, you know, a new investor sitting here. So again, sitting on cash is okay. Where to invest? The other thing I would tell a new investor is, I would actually tell them to look at their job. I would tell them to ask a hard question about their job, right? Are you certain, certain that you're in a position that won't be uh, let go if there's more white collar layoffs? Because there will be, right? For example, are you, are you, are you working at a very strong company that maybe you're working on a new product and there's a chance the new product doesn't see the light of day, right? I have worked in management positions where I've had to do layoffs, right? I remember vividly looking at spreadsheets going, oh my God, I've got to let go of 7% of these people, right? So I would tell people to look at their job, right? Are you, are you attached to revenue? If you are attached to revenue, you're safe, right? Real revenue, not future pontificated revenue, um, right? Or are you just a cost center and you, know, you could be outsourced, right? So I would tell people, uh, again, if you're sitting on cash, I would ask you to look at your job first and make sure that you're certain, like 99.9% .9 certain you're going to have a job in six months. That's something else I would tell people to do. Yeah, that's that's a really good, really good piece of advice. And, you know, I teetered on worrying about that a lot. You know, after 2009, when AIG almost went under, we were told constantly, yeah. we're probably going to be laid off. We should be prepared. We should start looking. Thankfully, I was in a role where it was very difficult to replace me because there was knowledge that was needed that was extremely complicated and very few people in the industry would even have that. Huh. So it it is what allowed me to leave on my own terms after 10 years, but thinking every year, this is the year I'm being laid off. They're finally going to find a buyer for my division. And so what that did is it gave me a healthy dose of, I have to have enough fear that that's going to happen, that I'm careful in my spending and I'm careful not to go into too much debt while I grow my portfolio, you know? So um, if you think that there's a chance you could get laid off, you better be saving at least three to six months of your own expenses to yep. cover that before you start going and buying a property that you're going to be, you know, pinching pennies on and maybe have to eat some of the mortgage payment with your salary. Yep. 
Yep. So, you know, be very, very cautious if you think you're in a role where your job isn't secure. And, you know, if you save three to six months of your own income as, ex, you know, to cover expenses, and then you have enough that you're comfortable with, with investing, invest. Otherwise, find partners that have money and don't put everything you have and max out all your cards just to take down a property. Yeah, I would tell you, I just echo that. We'll close this session is this is not a moment to go all in, right? 2010, 2011, it's pretty easy to go all in. This is not the market to do that. Would you agree? Agree. Very cool. Anna. Well, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to number three. Sounds great.